Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're going to be concentrating on the role that secrets and repressed ideas play across the novella The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. But before we get into that I'd like to encourage you to hit subscribe and join my tribe for all things English, literary and grammatical. At the heart of this gothic novella are questions. Questions that we have about secrets that are built upon things we don't understand that draw on our suspense, that fuel the mystery. We're drip-fed information across this text, and it's not shared freely in conversation between characters like Utterson and Lanyon about Jekyll. No, it's documents that are used to share information in the form of letters or incident reports. It's important for us to note that actually by chapter nine, we learn that Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde are the same person. But it takes nine chapters to get to that point. So in many ways, the bedrock of this novella is isolation and shame that leads Jekyll to hiding in secret places his concerns about his identity. And he's not the only one. In chapter 10, he shares his revelations but why does Stevenson care so much about drawing our attention to the secrets that characters try to hide? Well, Victorian society had firm expectations about how things should be, and perhaps he's critiquing this. But also I think it's important for us to now gaze more critically at what others in other fields at the time would have been referencing. And I want to enter into the equation Sigmund Freud. He is the founding father of psychoanalysis, a study into the deep of the subconscious, in particular our unconscious ideas. These are ideas buried deep within us that we might hide away. Now Freud was alive and working alongside uh, the time that Stevenson is writing this novella and he did studies on wealthy people uh, who wanted to unearth what was strange about them and deal with their own mental demons. So as much as Freud never commented directly on this novella, I'm confident that he would have been fascinated by the way in which Stevenson narrates the path that Jekyll takes and how deeply he buries his secret alter ego in the form of Mr Hyde. Now if we were to fast forward to the 20th century, Michel Foucault, a philosopher and historian and social critic, he actually re-evaluated the idea of Victorian society having such tight, repressed ideas. For him, he believed that Victorians were very good at pointing the finger about how others were doing things wrong, so much so that they invented the mental asylum or they placed people into workhouses. So his view was that secrets were dealt with by putting people in institutions that manage their demons. Now all of this is in some way relevant to you and your analysis of this text because it places you into a critical sphere to be able to critique why and how Stevenson does things and for you to have another layer to your own analysis. The rest of this video is not critiquing Freud or Foucault but instead it's giving you the language and the evidence that you might want to unpack this theme more deeply. I hope it's of use to you and I'd love you to comment down below with any reflections or analysis that you have. So in chapter two, Utterson is sharing his concern that his friend Jekyll is being blackmailed by Mr Hyde. And he says, the ghost of some old sin, the cancer of some concealed disguise. And that semantic field of lurking, sinister suffering, whether that's through the noun ghost, the idea of a sin that lingers with the adjective old coupled beside it, the gross and intense malignancy and evil that lurks in a cancer, and the idea that this is something that's beneath the surface, it's concealed, there's a disguise. It seems as if there's something hidden. And then later, within the same conversation, Utterson is sharing his alarm that actually Hyde must have his own secrets. 
He has secrets of his own, black secrets, compared to which Jekyll's worst would be like sunshine. And so the assumption that Utterson has taken that Mr Hyde must be blackmailing his friend, Dr Jekyll, is reiterated. But it's also heightening the evil of Mr Hyde, the repetition of secrets in that phrasing, and equally the juxtaposition of Jekyll as innocent through the simile like sunshine accentuates again sunshine versus black, goodness versus evil. When in reality, we will find out that Jekyll and Hyde are both sides of the same individual. And that duality question throws out the idea that one is good and one is bad. The secret, though, is what keeps compelled and compressed the idea that Jekyll is good and Hyde is bad. In chapter three, the description of the impact that this secret has on Jekyll is revealed when Utterson's description shares that the large, handsome face of Dr Jekyll grew pale to the very lips and there came a blackness about his eyes. This is simply at the mention of Mr Hyde's name. And we can definitely see the image of him growing pale right to his lips and the image of blackness about his eyes as a physiological reaction of distress, almost like a fear reaction, as if he'd seen a ghost. But there's a sinister shift of his features. He's gone from being described as a large, handsome face to somebody who looks as pale as a ghost who's got something sinister about their eyes. And actually, in particular, blackness about his eyes to Victorian readers, that would have rung alarm bells. They truly believed that eyes were the window to the soul. So blackness around the eyes, there's something sinister lurking deep beneath your soul. It's another feature of the Gothic. Then sensational and sensual imagery of sight that we see he grew pale and there came a blackness about his eyes. But it heightens this sense that something ominous is happening. And we understand later, when we reflect back on this moment, that Jekyll is terrified about his secret being revealed. It's not just Jekyll who's petrified. In chapter six, Lanyon narrates that he's had a shock and he shall never recover. It's quite euphemistic language here. He dies of the shock that he mentions in chapter six. And this refers to him seeing what we learn in chapter nine of Jekyll turning into Hyde on the spot. We learn in chapter nine through the form of the letter where Lanyon says, I cannot bring my mind to set on paper. I saw what I saw, I heard what I heard and my mind is sickened at it. In this particular context, it's the bombardment of the senses with the repetition of sight and hearing and also the possessive pronoun, my, alongside the narration of what was in his mind. My mind, repeated, suggests how damning that image is. It's sickening to see the secret exposed. He doesn't even know the damage that Jekyll has been hiding by suppressing his addiction to the potion that makes him hide. But it's so scary for Lanyon, he dies on the spot. So when we get Jekyll's reaction in chapter 10, when he writes his incident, he says, I'm careless as I lay down the pen and I proceed to seal up my confession. I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. Wow, the finality of the price he's paying for this secret that he dies with. It's tragic. It's such a clear glimpse into the damage that Jekyll faces when he says he's the unhappy Henry Jekyll we have to ask is he more unhappy because of his choices to hide his pleasures and live through them with Hyde or is this more a broad conversation of suffering that society has imposed on him it's important to finally mention that Jekyll in French means I kill myself And Hyde obviously has connotations of hiding. In this text about secrecy and repression, I think those names are telling. 
Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?